progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we continue in our study of the book of Judges, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that we may more properly understand the examples that are being presented before us? Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we come before you this day, for we have great need of your wisdom. We thank you for this time that we may spend together, where we may study openly, where we may study with other brothers and sisters. We ask you, Father, for your guidance and your direction. Help our minds to be open to the words that we are about to read. Help us to carefully consider the thoughts that you would have us to see at this time in Earth's history. Be with us today, Father. There are many that need you. We need you in this study so that we may more properly understand that which we are about to read. All words that we find in scripture are important. All are worthy of consideration. Help us to consider them so that we may go forward. Be with us each one, for you know our needs. You know our wants, you know our desires. Help us this day. For this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, as we look at this, as we open Judges chapter 5, it's interesting to note that the translators did not have specific notes for different sections. Judges 5 is one of those books of the Bible where it is not divided. It is to be considered as one complete message. Different from Judges 4, different from many of the other books that we have recently been reading. So here we have the song of Deborah and Barak. Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day, saying, where else do we find songs that are offered within scripture? Well, the song, the song of Moses. Um, I can't think of all the different places, but uh, I know there's the Song of Moses. So as, as we would look, as you just mentioned, we would have the Song of Moses in Exodus 15. Mm -hmm. Exodus 151. Okay. The one that if we were looking at the symbolism here would be of the 15th day of the first month. Mm -hmm. Then sang Moses... <clears throat> And the children of Israel, this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, <clears throat> for he hath triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. But now we also have Psalms 18.1, David's psalm of thanksgiving for God's mighty deliverances and manifold blessings. These are the two that the translators chose to give reference on. Mm -hmm. So we have three references, three direct examples of songs that are given within scripture. Praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel when the people willingly offered themselves. What are they trying to tell us here? Uh, 
What symbols do we find here? Will the Lord's word return unto him void? No, it doesn't. He promises it wouldn't in Isaiah 55. So if his word does not return unto him void, and he gives a prophecy through one of his prophets, will that prophecy come to pass? Yes. So in this situation, are we not to praise the Lord for the Nashville prophecy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting here too. So the word avenging, one is you'll, you'll see it's uh, it's two different if you look at the Strong's numbers. It's actually two different words, uh, which are basically the same word, just in a different form. Uh, para is the word, and um, now it really has to do with leadership. So that's kind of an odd. Uh, Odd thing here. Just hang on a second. So, what it says in Hebrew is be peroa, um, which is, and then it's going to say. Perot. So it has it in, in the masculine and in the, the femi feminine form. Well, I guess the one's not masculine. It's a, it's a preposition. So let me see here. This doesn't really figure this out. So I, I don't quite understand the idiom of why they translate it this way. I mean, they translate it as avenging. Um, it means to loosen. And let me look at Brown Driver Spriggs. So, so you got the two different words. It, it means to lead or act as a leader, to let go, to loose, ignore, let alone. Um, so I don't see how it means avenge, um, especially in the form to let loose or let go. And then, so that's the, the first one. And then the next one, which is really the same word, it means a leader or a commander. Um, So I'm not sure how they translate this as avenging. I don't see anywhere that this word means avenging. Unless they're just taking it as some kind of idiom. Um, it's very odd. So if in, instead of taking it in the literal, if they're taking it in the figurative, how would we apply this? Well, I don't know. Um, for freeing free men in Israel is the way that Young's literal translation translated, translates it. Freeing free men, is that not a doubling? Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. It is a doubling because it's the same word, right? It's just in two different forms. Then in this situation, since we're dealing with leadership, since we are dealing with a doubling, is it possible that this is the release of those that have been under the misconception of how to study 
and that God's word is about to be revealed in its purity. That's possible. Um, now, other translations translate this, this green, they think of as the hair of the head being let loose or to let grow the hair. Um, so, so it's translated quite differently. But the idea of avenging, I don't think is there at all. Well, if we were to look at the cross-references that the translators used, yeah, we would, we would again back, go back to Psalm 18. Psalm 18, 47. It is God that avengeth me and subdueth the people under me. Now, again, here is David's psalm for thanksgiving for God's mighty deliverances and manifold blessings. As we look a little further, 2 Chronicles 17, 16. Yeah. See, in that word there, avengeth is not any relationship to the words there in um, Judges. Okay. Then what is, what's the relationship or what is the word here? In Psalm 1847? Yes. It means, um, well, you have the first word is Nathan, which is giving, um, um, which means to give, right? And then the other word is uh, nekama, which means to avenge or vengeance. So it is God that gives vengeance to me. Is what it would literally be, but that that is avenge. So it's not related at all to what's stated in Judges chapter five, verse two. Okay. So they're just looking at the English word, but the Hebrew is not related at all. And I don't see that it means avenge. So um, I can't even see how it would be is an idiom to refer to it vengeance either so i'm not sure why the king james translators translated it that way okay so is this something we should we should go back to crudence and see what crudence has to say you could yeah i just think it's a bad translation on the, on the king james version part of it I mean, they put in the definition, they'll put it, it's avenging or revenge in that it's translated that way in the King James. But that's not the meaning of the word. So when you look at Strong's, it will give you the meaning of the word, and then it'll tell you how it's been translated in the King James. But it doesn't mean that that's what it means just because it's been translated that way in the King James. So it has been translated as avenging or revenge in the King James. That's not the sense of the word at all. Yeah, I find it's interesting because the um, in Cruden's, the uh, two cross references that they give here would be 1 Samuel 25, 26 and 1 Samuel 25, 33. Yeah. So again, it's not a related word when they're talking about avenging. Okay. Now, Cruden's breaks it out interestingly because it gives avenge, avenged, and avenger, and it looks like all of those have different words, at least according to the way that this is set up in Cruden's. Yeah. So, Second Chronicles seventeen sixteen, and next him was Amasiah the son of Zikri, who willingly offered himself unto the Lord, and with him two hundred thousand mighty men of valor.
And then we would come to 1 Maccabees 2.42. Then came there unto him a company of Assyrians, who were mighty men of Israel, even all such as were voluntarily devoted unto the law. And this completes this portion because praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel when the people willingly offered themselves. What strikes me here in Judges 5 verse 2. Okay, I just got to go back here. Okay, please. So maybe part of the problem here is the word avenge. Okay. Because the word avenge actually means uh, to free. All right. So we we don't think of the word the word of avenge of where it comes from, right? So what do we think of as avenge means? Avenge being portion of revenge. Well, well yeah. So it 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 means to, um, like, to basically pay back something somebody for something they've done, you know. Right. To get back at them, but but the word, uh, in its origins, can be restored or freed. Um. Uh, to assert or lay claim for freedom or set free. Right. So so I could see that the King James translators, what they were doing is they're translating the word correctly, but they're translating it with a different meaning than we use it today. All right. But it should be praise ye the Lord for the freeing of Israel. Are we not being freed right now in our method of study? Yeah. But, but it's just interesting sometimes, you know, you can look at a word and it's just changed its meaning over time. But when they translated it, it had a different connotation or meaning than it has today. Right. I would agree. Yeah. So that's, that's why they translated it that way. So they were translating it correctly, but in a different uh a different sense than we would take it. So the idea of Young's literal translation, freeing the freemen, um, I kind of think is uh, the best way to look at that. So if we're looking at freeing the free men, yes, is that not different from freeing the slaves? Yes. Free in what sense, though? Well, in the sense of vindicating them. That's that's kind of the idea of this word. Well, okay, I'm I'm asking this question. Uh, I'm trying to recall the verse out of Revelation that speaks of those that were not under the, as we would see it, the papal heresy. Right. That were virgins. Mm -hmm. Would that also not be a, another description of the free man? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and now the, it, the word also has the sense of a leader as well. Right. So um, could this be a reference to the 144,000? Well, it could be. I, I would just think in the context, in the way that we're making this application. So this is the... The judges are responding against the oppressor, which is the teachings methodology and um, the way in which they address issues in this movement, right? So that's the backbiting, uh, the character assassination, and so forth, 
but God has freed the free men. And, and how did he do that? By people studying God's word. And these, for the people willingly offered themselves, bless ye Jehovah, it says here in uh, Young's literal translation. Um, so, so we become free through the gospel, right? This is through the study of God's word. And those that, that have an ear to hear, let them hear, right? So we know that um, it's been through this chronology that we have been freed from this papal system. It's something objective. Instead of addressing people and issues in a subjective way, we had this objective way of looking at things. And that's, so that's what's being talked about here. I know I'm not explaining it well at all. Okay. When the people willingly offered themselves. Mm -hmm. This entire verse is giving reference to those that were participating and believing in the message of July 18th. Mm -hmm. Because as we were looking at this yesterday, those that chose to follow with Parminder were critical. They didn't want anything to do with this. They felt that this was a fallacy, that this was not representing what they thought the message should be in any manner. And we heard the same thing from many that have stayed within the corporate church. Now, willingly offered themselves. This is the idea of people that um, uh, are volunteering. Right. Right. So that's what the word means. It's in the Hithpa'al form, means to volunteer. It also can mean to offer free will offerings. So it has to do with free will to make a choice. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have a free will, how can you follow and agree to disseminate a message mm -hmm. without without being afraid of it? But it's just interesting. So you have, if we took this literally, for freeing freemen in Israel who freely offered themselves or right. freely volunteered. So it's kind of interesting. We have three different times a word that means freely or freedom or free. So when we have a triple application like this, what does that point to? Or what, well, how should we well, see it? The third angel's message. Okay. Hear, O ye kings, give ear, O ye princes. I, even I, will sing unto the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Kings, princes, and I, even I. Is this a progression? I don't I don't know. I mean, when you're when you're looking at this with kings and then princes being mentioned, how many kings 
or princes were there in the tribes that Barak called. I think that they're giving reference here that this is a message that is one that, that leads to a groundswell. It is the people, not the leaders, that are now singing praises to the Lord God. Um, okay, so... It's kind of an interesting verse again. Because um, it says, Hear ye kings, and give ear ye princes. Now, this idea here, this is placing an emphasis upon um, considering, weighing, right? So the idea of uh, you know, the first one uh, here, which is in a sense of obeying, which is ref referring to the kings, and then uh, this word um, that is uh, give ear, um, it, it really means to, to wit uh, consider or weigh or prove, to examine something. And and then it uses the word princes. Well, well, this word that's translated princes could be translated as princes. Um, but it also could be translated instead of being a noun. It could be mean to uh, judge judiciously. Um, so it's possible here... Uh, that this is is not so much about princes it's it's more a focusing upon the system of of study of how we are to study um because even the word king can be translated as counsel so you could look at this as hear counsel and consider judiciously instead of translating it the way the King James translators have translated it. I'm not saying that they're not translating it correctly, but I'm just saying that these words have, have other meanings. But in the figurative, as we have been approaching all of these passages in, in Judges. Yeah this would make much more sense. Well, yeah, it would give uh, significance to why they're saying uh, kings and princes, because this has to do with how we are studying, how we are considering things. So, I mean, it could be kings and princes, like I'm not saying you can't translate it that way. Yeah, this would make more sense in the context of what we're talking about, just using it in this more the meanings of those those titles. What it does is it it lines up better with the other two verses we just read. Yeah. Because if we're dealing here instead of looking at avenging in the in the current definition mm -hmm. that we're dealing with free men 
willingly offering themselves. And then here it's to give counsel that we need to consider carefully this method of study. Mm -hmm. Then are we not going to praise God, especially for the examples that we have been given by Miller's rules? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is basically describing how the enemy is overcome. Right. By obeying, hearing intelligently, right? Taking counsel. Um, considering, listening, um, and then um, with the word princes, to be judicious, to be weighty, right? That's the idea of razan. Um, so this would fit in, even though you can translate it as kings and princes. But I would think in this context, if we're making this application, these kings and princes are the ones who are following Miller's rules of study. So if, if, if you went back to look at Young's literal translation, as you did on the prior verse, how would Young's have seen this? Well, he just translates it the same way. Here, you kings, give you your princes. But I'm just looking at, um, I wasn't looking at Young's. I was looking at the scholar's gateway. Okay and just looking at the words themselves okay right so what they mean um and then and then brown drivers brings definitions as well and and then of course you have the doubling right after that exactly yeah now it says um that word uh anoki which means i or me and then it has um, uh, in between that uh, to Jehovah, and then it has that word I again. Anoki. Yeah, Anoki. So it's it's um, but in between it, it puts the word to Jehovah with a lamet in front of it, which means against or to. Um, so uh, that's kind of interesting. Um, Why is it interesting? I to the Lord, I, right? Okay. Is how they put it. So they don't say, um, right? And, and you can see that in, uh, well, in the King James, it has, I, even I will sing unto the Lord. Uh, the Jewish Publication Society says, I unto the Lord, I will sing. Um, so it's it's putting the Lord in the center of this chiasm where I is on either side. So it's a doubling, but but the Lord is the center. So it's like the chiasm. All right. So it's just the King James puts I, even I, which usually means, you know, those two words are right next to each other in Hebrew. But in this case, to the Lord is in between the, the personal pronoun, first person singular. Okay. And then, um, and then it doesn't say again, I will sing unto the Lord. So there isn't three eyes like you have. Um, let me see. Well, I guess. I, even I will sing unto the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God. Um, just looking at the Hebrew. Anyway, I thought that was interesting.
it's interesting that as you're seeing it as a chiasm here. Yeah. Now, the translators here gave reference back to Deuteronomy 32 and Psalms 210. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. How many times have we gone over this, this particular passage within the movement over the last 20 years? Well, lots. And we also connect it always with Hosea 6.3. Um, okay. Right, then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning and he shall come unto us as the rain and as the latter and former rain unto the earth. So this is dealing with um, the latter rain and the former rain. Okay. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. So here again, kings and judges mm -hmm. instead of kings and princes. Um, yeah. so to... yeah. Okay. Judges 9 4, or 5 4, excuse me. Lord, when thou wentest out of Seir, when thou marchest out of the field of Eden, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped, the clouds also dropped water. Seir and Edom, is that not a doubling? Because we're looking at the government of Esau and the field of Edom or Esau. How should we look at this symbolically? Well, I don't know if I'd put it as a doubling. It's just uh, maybe repeat and enlarge. Okay, but um, yeah. here the translators again have gone back to Deuteronomy and Psalms. And he said, the Lord came forth from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran and he came with 10,000 of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. And Psalm 68, seven, O God, when thou wentest forth before thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness, Shalah. Now the other verses that were being given reference here, then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wroth. 2 Samuel 22, 8. Psalm 68, 8. The earth shook. The heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Isaiah 64, 3. When thou didst terrible things which we looked not for, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. Habakkuk 3.3. 3. Mm -hmm. God came from Teman, 
and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Selah. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Yeah, that whole section there in Habakkuk 3, verse 3 to 16 is interesting. Okay. Um, Because I I believe it has a lot of references to this message. Okay. Um, It's interesting that the translators would choose these as references then to that verse. Mm -hmm. Because it would give us more evidence of how this is being written more for our time than the time in which it was written. Yeah. Um. I was intrigued by the fact that seven verses later, they chose to give reference to the mountains saw thee and they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep ushered, uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. So if the overflowing of the water passed by. That's the Sunday law. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the deep utters his voice. So God would be speaking, protecting his people, protecting his honor after this with the sunday law okay so i would say the deep uttering his voice this is the this right abusos um well you know it's to home because this is hebrew okay okay so um but the idea of um of the voice the speaking of the dragon power right because we have the sunday law and we also they have the hand of the papacy right i mean the actually you know you have the word his hands on high it's kind of interesting the word uh for high is um rome <laughs> uh but i think this is um I mean, this could be referring to the Sunday law. Okay. Even though, you know, this this often refers to God's judgments. um, But God has allowed the Sunday law to occur. Okay. You know, it's just we have all these, um, uh, this symbolism. So the mountains saw thee, they trembled, the overflowing of the waters passed by, the deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. As the light of thine arrows they went, and at the shining of thy glittering spear. Thou didst march through the land in indignation, thou didst stretch the heathen in anger. Right? So there's almost like these contrasts of symbolism between what God is doing and what uh, the world has done. It's like describing the great controversy in some ways. Interesting. So what we're seeing is a another symbolic representation of this this battle for control of the world. Right. This is you know if you want to call it the Battle of Armageddon, right? Okay. Um, because this is about God's victory over over the heathen, but a lot of this symbolism is the symbolism that we use for the powers of the world. But God is victorious over those powers. 
um, you know, Habakkuk 3, 4, and his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand. Now that, that word horns means like um, rays of light. And there was the, and there was the hiding of his power. Um, so God has been giving us this light, the light of the midnight cry. And remember, God's hand hid a mistake in some of the figures. Right. So, so, so to me, this is is God's intervention. It's it's basically, if you look at um, what we're how we're understanding judges, you have these enemies that are still there they're left for god to test us or prove us right and now we see you know this reference here in habakkuk which of course is an important book for this movement um we can see that god is going to be victorious over these enemies in the very and the very symbolism that is used um for these enemies for what they're doing are also used for God's victory over them, right? Because we have the hand. We know there's the hand of the papacy, but we also have the Lord's hand, right? We have the overflowing scourge, the Sunday law, but we also have God. God comes as a flood. I don't know. Is that making sense to people? The symbolism, I think, is very pointed. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the kind of study that we need, and we're going to have to address for ourselves, because when we're looking just at, at the way that this is written in the song of Deborah and Barak, mm -hmm. rarely would we take the time to pull up what the translators have seen as the cross references. Mm -hmm. Going into it the way you just did helps us more to be able to make relevant this portion of the song because Habakkuk is indeed one of the books that is written for this movement and for this time. Mm -hmm. But when we're comparing this also with Psalms, with Isaiah, and we're looking at all of the other symbols that are here, whether we're dealing with Taman, Paran, and then looking, as, as you're saying, at this entire passage in Habakkuk 3 up through verse 16, It's almost like a count, a point counterpoint kind of a situation. Here is what God is doing. Here is what man being led by the beast is doing. Yeah. And, and you can see here, this is going back, of course, to what they're conquering of the promised land itself, right? In this song of Deborah and Barak, right? So they're just reviewing the fact that they have come and conquered the promised land. But right, they're going to deal with Sinai and et cetera. Leaving well, especially in dealing with Sierra and Paran. Yeah. But when we're dealing with this on the promised land and we bring it to the, the modern usage, our usage, mm -hmm. are we not dealing with the movement itself within the modern promised land of America. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can see that Deborah and Barack in calling out two of the tribes not two of the greater tribes, mm -hmm. but two of the northern tribes. 
two of the tribes that went and were cast more into idolatry because they had chosen the path of idolatry. But at this point, they're making the choice to follow willingly the call of Barak and that of Deborah, because Barak did not believe that he was capable of giving this message. Uh-huh. What else can we see here? Well, the clouds dropping water, right? So this is rain. Um, and that's what we've seen in this movement is this sprinkling of the latter rain well okay the earth trembled and the heavens dropped the clouds also dropped water the clouds dropping water is that not another well The dew shall fall as the rain upon the tender herb. Didn't we just cover that? Mm -hmm. And how would we have approached the dew falling as the rain upon the tender herb? How's that historically been approached within the movement? Are we not looking forward to that of the latter rain? Yeah. So this is not only a message, it is the latter rain message. Mm -hmm. Well, what this reminds me of back in uh, the mid 1980s, um, when we had our upper room Bible study group in the attic of my house, and um, we had a, we had, um, I think there was a book by Olson. He was uh, it was just a compilation of Ellen White quotes. Uh, I can't remember the title of the book, but it was about preparation for the latter rain, and and we had gone through all of these quotes. And and our Bible study group was praying for the latter rain. I mean, we had no real idea what we were praying for. Because we really didn't understand much. I was a relatively new Adventist. And um, when we start to look at the latter rain now, in our in our understanding, we know that it's a message. It's not something that just happens. You know, it's like we... We get some kind of power because the Holy Spirit's somehow poured out on us. Um, It actually comes through a study of God's word. Now we have this word dropped, uh, which means to fall in drops, but figuratively it means to speak by inspiration, according to Strong's. And... This inspiration, of course, we have the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. But God has inspired his people through the study of his word. He, the Holy Spirit, is given to those who are studying God's word. Right? Because no prophecy of scripture of, his, of any private interpretation. For holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And what that means is in order to understand what the Bible says, you need the Holy Spirit to understand it. Man's mind cannot just study the Bible and understand it. You need inspiration. The same spirit that inspired the Bible writers is the same spirit that interprets the scriptures to those that study it. And so the clouds dropping this water 
Um, and it says, when thou marchest out of the field of Edom, when thou wentest out of Seir, which of course is um, talking about God, right? But we are cooperating with God as we study his word. So in order to understand the things that we, have, that we understand now, uh, this was not just something magical that happened. This was something that was a promise of God, and it was done by God. And that's the problem, is many people don't recognize this. And, and I think part of the problem may be because when they study, they're not really looking for inspiration from God. They're just using human intellect to understand God's word. I mean, that's Parminder through and through. Right. He, he was approaching everything intellectually. But he was approaching it without the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Right. He felt we needed the leadership of the organization, of the people. I mean, as we talked about before, God was giving this movement light from all quarters. And instead, they set up um, the, the biblical analysis group, whatever it was called, uh, doctrinal analysis group, to decide, you know, to... I mean, I was on the doctrinal analysis group, and, and they wanted us to, to read papers and decide if those papers were correct or not. Where every person should read those papers and decide for themselves. Why would you put a, a committee of men to decide whether something was worthy of being published? It, it never made sense to me. Okay. A lot of what went on with Parminder was not making sense with me. Yeah. But because we believe that God is going to lead a people, not an organization. He's going to lead individuals because they connect with him. And yeah, um, and God is still giving light to his people. And he doesn't have just one channel of light. And he doesn't have one person that he gives light to and everyone needs to listen to that person or a group of people that have light and everyone must listen to that, to that group of people. Because light comes to each individual as they study his word, as they examine these things. And as they're obedient, then they can know whether they're true or not. Well, we also, we have a couple of examples, one of which being William Miller. Mm -hmm. How much light came to the organization that preceded William Miller? As in, Miller was, he was a Baptist, right? Yeah. But did the light given to Father Miller come first from the Baptist Church? Well, no. So here is an example. Here is Paul, formerly Saul. Was there, was there light that was given to the organization that Saul was a member of? Or was this great light given to Paul as he came to understand the way that God was, was leading him? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and we see God giving light to all these different individuals. And, and also we're gathering up that light, which is what the organization can help do is gather together light. That's what Jeff was doing. He would be another example of that. Yes. Like Miller. And and for Jeff, he he wanted people to examine things. He would sometimes present information. He would send me papers. And what do you think of what this person's saying? Is there any light here? Even though there may be error mixed in, Jeff was willing to look at something that maybe this person had something and that we needed to consider it. But Parminder wasn't wanting to do that. Right. Parminder didn't like that attitude. He didn't like that way of looking at these things. No. Now, as it continues, the mountains melted before the Lord, or the mountains flowed from before the Lord. Even that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel. Why is it that we need to note that the mountains flowed or melted. I mean, as I understand it, symbolically, mountains are governments. So these governments will not govern. They're going to flow away. How else can we look at this? What what other things could we say? I mean, this is really referring also to Sinai. Right. Right. So this is the giving of the law. When God was on, upon Mount Sinai, so okay. it, it's tying it's tying this light uh, to the law to obedience. So the cross references here. We have Deuteronomy 411, 411. And ye came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire unto the midst of heaven, with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. Psalms 97, 5. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. And then we have Exodus 19, 18. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace and the whole mount quaked greatly. So God's presence is that of a consuming fire, but it's also something that makes, when he makes an entrance, it's worthy of note. It's something that we need to pay attention with. It's not something that can be set aside.
in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied and the walkers of paths walked through crooked ways, looking at the alternate readings. Is this identifying a time period? Well, this is a time of oppression. Um, so I would I would say because we looked at Shamgar, right? Um, and then we also talked about the days of jail. So when the highways are unoccupied, the reason that that, that is they're not being protected. And so right. the travelers can't go on the open highway and feel safe. They're gonna have to take alternate routes or else you're gonna face robbers. And and, and this is definitely true um, of how I've had to address um, presenting things in this movement. I don't think you're alone. Yeah. I mean, constantly your enemies are in the way. And you have to be careful. And I've had so many times where I, I, I said something to someone at some time or other, and um, that what was said would be uh, get back to Jeff or to someone else in such a distorted way. Um, and I tried to do everything as openly as I could. That is, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to do anything secretly, but those paths were shut down again and again. Um, because of what was happening with people who were really the enemies of the message who were still in the movement. It's, you know, for me, it's a sad situation because there's so much light that has come from the chronology, from the numbers. Yet, this is the portion that is being, or is attempted to being shut down. Mm -hmm. What makes it sad is the denial of Palmona. We are given the figure of Palmoni to understand that we are dealing with the wonderful number, the number of secrets, so that when these numbers, when this chronology is being presented, we're able to recognize that it comes from God. Mm -hmm. Yet there are those that wish not to have anything to do with us because in their mind it's too hard to understand or well you're just you're not as as friendly in your presentation you're too harsh the conspiracy theories for many are to be embraced and accepted where the chronology is to be shunned. For me, this is relating it in the same manner as what Mrs. White said about the 1888 General Conference session. That if Christ himself had stood before those delegates, they would have crucified him anew.
if we are not willing to accept the chronology from Palmona, then what are we accepting? Now, this verse dealing with Shamgar to JL. Shamgar destroyed the Philistines with an ox goat, correct? And how long did the land have peace under Shamgar? I don't think it says. You're right. Because all it says, and after him was Shamgar, the son of Anna, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. So he deliver he he slays six hundred men. Is the number six hundred another numerical representation of something as important as we were addressing earlier with the nine hundred? I mean, it's certain that, that six is divisible into the 2520, just like the 900 is. That he slew 600 with an ox goad with a pointed stick. Has reference for us right now. Because for many, this message is very much like a pointed stick. Any other considerations here? Well, the only thing I can say was 600, if you put it into 18,720, you get 31.2. And that can symbolically represent 31 AD dividing the 70th week or the chiasm. Right. And if you put it into uh, 2520, you get 4.2, which I'm not sure how we would apply that. I mean, it can be, I don't know. But I'm just doing the same thing we did with 900 in those numbers. Right. Um, But I would think it has something to do with the message of chronology, the symbolic use of numbers. But how exactly, I don't know. Yeah, 900 is 2.8. So if you add 4.2 and 2.8, you get 7. OK. Very nice. So. Would we look that Shamgar in his deliverance for, in, in the slaying of the Philistines was during that same time where Ahud brought rest to the land for the four score years? Yeah, 
Yeah, well, that's the, the way I understand it. Any other thoughts on that, Stephen? Before I say it again? Okay. Would the situation with Shamgar be concurrent with the situation of Ahud, where Ahud brought rest to the land for four score years? Would that be part of that, that time frame, possibly? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, or it could be part of the Deborah time period. Okay. I'm just looking at this because there, there would be some that would think that the situation with Shamgar only was relevant to the land that was bordering with the Philistines, which in, in my mind would make it to the Western side where Deborah and Barak are dealing primarily in the North. Right, so you have, you have uh, the story of Ehud, it's gonna be in the East. Right. Shamgar's in the West, Deborah and Barak are in the North. Okay. Right, which is one of the problems when people try to deal with the judges is they think of them all of happening successively, each one following the other. Consecutively. Uh, yeah, consecutively. So successively would be two, another way of saying it. But anyway, consecutively. So they follow one after the other. And um, so, but that's not correct. So you can't just add up these periods of time. Now, of course, with Shamgar, they don't give us a period of time. Right. But but still, you know, you don't take uh, the 40 years and, and then just keep adding all these different periods of time together to get the period of the judges. Because a lot of these things are happening at the same time. Verse 6 would seem to tie time period of Deborah and Shamgar at the same time? Um, well, they could. It just could say that in the days of Shamgar and also in the days of JL that we have the same situation. But yeah, it's true. yeah. But it's hard to know uh, specifically. Um, but the way that I look at it, at least as far as we, we see it symbolically, this shows that Shamgar, because how we understood Shamgar had to do with uh, the message of chronology. And we see that also with Deborah and Barak. And so they're, in that time period, it's, it's not, um, there isn't a highway for the chronology to travel on. Let's put it that way. It's not something generally accepted in the movement. There's lots of opposition to what's happening. Even when it's finally accepted by Jeff and he's presenting it, there's still a lot of resistance. You know, there's a lot of resistance when I was there at the School of the Prophets uh, to what was happening. And, and a lot of resistance that was online as well. Why was there so much resistance online? Well, the complaints that I kept getting, uh, I mean, what we've talked about, it's complicated. Um, you know, just sort of, do we have to accept these things? Um, do we have to understand these things? Um, it, it was just not, I, I mean, 
I mean, we saw it there with, with Bronwyn, especially when I was there. Just the, the sort of frustration. Um, and even some of the, the group, um, which, which a lot of light came from some of this opposition as well, because that helped me dig deeper into things and find some things. So, for instance, there was this real resistance to the idea of uh, the, th the 309, um, 390 days that he lies on his left side and then 40 days on his right side, Ezekiel. And uh, the one family there, they were just so adamant it couldn't, it has to be a period of 430 years because he lies consecutively 430 days. But it was in the examination of that that actually led me to see um, uh, the 10th day of the fifth month in regard to his ending lying on his left side. And the um, uh, the August August fifteenth that he begins lying on his right side. So if it wasn't for some of this opposition, we wouldn't have actually had some of the light. That is, I wouldn't have spent the time to look into it at least at that time. So I, I don't know. The opposition never really made much sense to me. Uh, even some things that were very simple to understand, people would uh, question them and oppose them. And it wasn't the normal kind of thing where somebody just wants to look at it a bit more deeply. They're trying to find an objection so that they can reject it. And I had, I had a difficult time getting some of my videos up at the School of the Prophets as well. Bronwyn would with, with, withhold them and delay them being put on, on the internet. So I don't know. It's never made sense to me, really. But I'm maybe not the person to ask. OK. Now, we are coming to the close of our time together today. There are several other points that we're going to need to be looking at within this one verse before we go on further. Yeah, I just find it interesting, though. I know, I know what you're saying, but the next verse is really interesting. Sure, it's going to be. You know, because it says the inhabitants of the village is ceased. But if you look at it in, in Hebrew, it's uh, the leadership... Uh, desisted. And they were idle. What they were right idle. Now? What's that? Isn't that what we're finding right now? Yeah, they were idle, flabby, right? Lacking. They failed. They forsake. Right. They ceased in Israel. This is talking. I don't know why they translated as villages. Because this refers to the leadership, I mean, of a village sometimes, right? But it's, this is more the magist magistracy that is the leadership. So, so this is what happened. I mean, this is December 6th, uh, 2020. At least it's that, if not even earlier. But anyway, sorry about that. It's just I have to look at that next verse. Okay. Now, are there any other questions or thoughts from what we've been addressing today? And when we get into conversations like this, the time flies and flies quickly. Mm -hmm. But we can easily pick this up tomorrow. It's going to be interesting. Yes, it is. It's going to be really interesting. So any other comments? Okay, so shall we then close with prayer?
loving Father, we thank you for this opportunity to understand more. We thank you for this time that we have spent together today. Help us now to consider that which we have discussed. Be with us today in all that you would have us to do. Direct our steps. Show us that that you would have done. May your will be done in all that we do today. And may we be able to begin more properly showing your character to all of those with whom we come in contact. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.